I'm coming back to talk about kidneys, current guidelines, and recommendations. So first, we're going to talk about the imaging technique and then go over current guidelines that help us manage these renal masses, talk about differential diagnosis based on imaging features, and hopefully provide you with some tips and pitfalls. As Dr. Fishman mentioned, renal masses are commonly detected in asymptomatic individuals as incidental findings. And the majority of these renal masses are benign cysts. And the prevalence increases with age, such that they can be seen in up to 40% of patients on CT. And the clinical challenge is really in trying to balance the benefits of early RCC detection versus workup or treatment of a lot of these benign or small malignant masses, either with the treatment or serial follow-ups that really aren't necessary. There are several guidelines that help us manage these renal masses, and I'll mention the highlights, including the ACR management guideline in 2018, appropriateness criteria for indeterminate renal masses, the revised Bosnia classification in 2019, and also recommendations for active surveillance. When we think about the appropriateness criteria for the initial imaging of indeterminate renal, renal masses, if the patient has no contraindications, the best choices are really exams performed with IV contrast, be it CT, MRI, or ultrasound with contrast. In our practice, usually we do either CT or MRI, renal protocol. If the patient has contraindication to CT and MRI contrast, then ultrasound with contrast becomes a modality of choice, and also ultrasound of the kidneys and MRI without contrast. And if the contraindication is to CT contrast only, then usually we would end up doing an MRI with and without contrast. And at some institutions, they may prefer to do an ultrasound with IV contrast. For our renal mass protocol, we still do a traditional four-phase protocol with non-contrast, arterial phase, venous phase, and delayed phase images. Some institutions like to do a dual-phase CT, and that may improve the differentiation between non-enhancing cysts and low-level enhancing tumors. And also, theoretically, you can get rid of the non-contrast phase because you can use the dual energy capabilities mm -hmm. to give you virtual non-contrast. In our practice, we are still sticking with the traditional four-phase protocol because we find that the measurements are a little bit more reliable with the traditional mm -hmm. protocol. Mm -hmm. And also with the CTs, it's important to look at multiplanar reconstruction because small lesions at the upper pole and the lower pole of the kidney if you're just scrolling through the axial images, you can easily walk by it and miss them. And the coronal are really helpful in showing those lesions at the upper pole and lower pole to advantage so that you don't miss them. And 3D reconstructions are very helpful for the vascular mapping so you can see the vascular blood supply that can help the surgeon plan the surgery. And also these 3D images also help us appreciate the extent and also characterization of the lesion. And they are also helpful in distinguishing real masses from pseudomasses, such as in this example here. So this patient was referred in for renal mass biopsy. Superficially, when you look at this lesion, sure, it does look like a heterogeneously enhancing mass on the axials. But when you look at the coronal, you almost get the impression that the more central hypodense area is the unopacified renal calyces. And the reason it looks weird is because of distortion by this big renal cyst. So instead of doing a biopsy, I recommended the patient to come back for delayed phase images. And lo and behold, we can appreciate on the delayed phase that there's contrast opacification of the calyces. And this is just normal renal parenchyma and not a renal mass. And when we think about renal mass characterization, we need to pay attention to the size, attenuation, whether the lesion is homogeneous or heterogeneous, any internal enhancement, and the complexity of the cystic masses. And priors are always helpful in looking for growth and morphologic change over time. There are several features that indicate lesion heterogeneity, including wall thickening, septations, 
neural nodules, measurable or visible attenuation differences between phases and also within the lesion, and internal calcifications. Now, what are the criteria for enhancement? On CT, if there's a change of 20 household units or more in the pre and post contrast, that is considered definite for enhancement. Between 10 to 20 household units, that's considered equivocal. The difference of 10 household units or less, that's considered no enhancement. And on MRI, because we don't have absolute units, it's more a relative increase of 15% or more on the pre and post contrast that's considered enhancing lesion. And often it is also helpful to get subtraction images on MRI to see if there is any internal enhancement. Dr. Fishman already went over some of the rules on how we deal with these incidental renal masses, but I will also review them because I think repetition is helpful in helping us remember. So first off the bat, if we see a renal mass on non-contrast CT without any fat, we first want to look at whether the lesion is homogeneous or heterogeneous. A heterogeneous lesion is considered indeterminate and should be further worked up with renal protocol CT or MRI. With a homogeneous lesion, we need to look at the Hauser units. If it's low, less than 20 Hauser units, it's considered a benign cyst and no further work workup is necessary. 70 Hauser units or more, it's a proteinaceous or hemorrhagic cyst, also does not need any workup. It's the lesions in this kind of intermediate Hauser units that really require the renal protocol CT or MRI. Let's look at this example of a man coming in with flank pain. So clearly we can see a low density cystic lesion in the right kidney. But also in the left kidney, it may be hard to appreciate that there's this subtle lesion that's almost the same attenuation as the background kidney that's very hard to see. You can appreciate that a little bit better on the coronal with that contour deformity. And this patient was referred for MRI, and we can appreciate that the right renal lesion does not enhance, so that it's a simple renal cyst, and the left renal lesion shows heterogeneous enhancement, and it's a renal cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. So just be aware that the renal cell carcinomas tend to have this intermediate attenuation that's similar to the background kidney that's actually hard to pick up on these non-con images. Another patient coming in with multiple lesions of different attenuation. Some are low attenuation, some high, and some of that intermediate attenuation. Mm -hmm. So the next appropriate step, obviously, it's a renal protocol exam. Mm -hmm. And on the multi-phase images, we can appreciate that the right anterior lesion does not change. Mm -hmm. So it's just a simple mm -hmm. cyst. This middle lesion here also doesn't change on multiple dynamic phase images and it's a hemorrhagic or proteinaceous cyst, whereas the left renal lesion shows avid arterial enhancement with washout, and that is a renal cell carcinoma. What about if we find an incidental renal mass on contrast enhanced CT? Again, if the lesion is heterogeneous, it is indeterminate and needs to be further worked out. If it's low attenuation, then it's, we can call it a benign cyst and doesn't require any follow-up. And anything that is more than 20 Hauser units on a contrast enhanced CT are technically indeterminate and would require renal protocol CT or MRI. So look at this example here. So there's a posterior lesion, zero Hauser units. So if that was the only lesion, we can confidently dismiss that as a benign cyst. The anterior lesion here, 57 Hauser units, that is indeterminate, and we need to work it up whether it's an enhancing lesion or a hyperdense cyst. And what we got an MRI that showed that the posterior lesion surely does not enhance, and it's a simple cyst, whereas the anterior lesion is intrinsically bright on T1, and on the subtraction images, there, are, there is no internal enhancement, and that is just a proteinaceous cyst. But sometimes people mix up the rules. So this was an outside case, and it was a young lady with flank pain. This lesion was 48 Hauser units on a contrast enhanced exam, and they just flat out called it a Bosniak II cyst and didn't mention any follow-up. Mm 
patient had persistent pain and came to my hospital. And on ultrasound, you can immediately appreciate that this does not look like a cystic lesion. It's very heterogeneous in echo texture. So I recommended an MRI to further work this up. And it is a T2 hypointense lesion with internal enhancement. And this was confirmed a papillary carcinoma. So just keep in mind that on a contrast enhanced exam, a lesion of more than 20 household units is technically considered indeterminate. And we should not just blow these off as Bosnet 2 cysts. Mm -hmm. And this was a trainee of ours that made a similar mistake, that he was confusing the rules, that we saw this lesion 91 house units on a contrast in his scan. And he told me, well, since it's more than 70 house units, it's a proteinaceous cyst, right? And then I asked him, well, you don't really know if we had a non-con, whether it was a low-density lesion that enhanced or if it was a bright lesion that stayed at 90 household units on the pre and post. So when you encounter these high-density lesions that are more than 20 household units, you really ought to work it up with a proper renal protocol exam. And we obtained an MRI for this. And again, heterogeneous on T2 with enhancement. And this was confirmed a chromophobe RCC. When we think about solid renal tumors, we can, the differential includes renal cell carcinoma, oncocytoma, angiomyolipoma, renal medullary carcinoma, urothelial carcinoma, lymphoma, and METs. And the growth pattern and also the tissue characteristics can help us figure out what type of tumor it is. Clear cell renal cell carcinoma is the most common type of renal cell carcinoma, and cystic degeneration can occur in up to 15%. And when we think about clear cell renal cell, these are heterogeneously enhancing masses, and we may see the heterogeneity due to central necrosis, internal hemorrhage, and also microscopic fat. And because these are aggressive tumors, we may also see renal vascular invasion. This is a typical example of clear cell renal cell, in which you see a very heterogeneously enhancing mass with some renal vascular invasion. So this is very typical for renal cell. Papillary renal cell is the second most common type. As opposed to clear cell, which is avidly enhancing on arterial phase, these tend to be hypoenhancing masses and also tends to be T2 hypointense as opposed to clear cell, which is T2 hyperintense. Chromophobe is the third most common type of renal cell carcinoma. These tend to enhance more slowly and more homogeneous. So, this is a lesion that is homogeneous and hypoenhancing mass. So, very typical for chromophobe. So this is the early example that I showed of the chromophobe carcinoma, so kind of low level in hypoenhancement, more homogeneous than what you would expect for a clear cell. So based on the enhancement characteristics and how it looks on MRI, you can help try to figure out what kind of subtype it is. Clear cell tend to be hypervascular, and also these are more aggressive tumors. So you would expect to see vascular invasion, hemorrhage necrosis, and the classic syndromic associations include VHL and tuberous sclerosis. Papillary subtype, classically T2 hypointense, and that helps distinguish between clear cell and chromophobe. Chromophobe RCC are classically associated with Berthoff du Bay. And it's also important to remember that sometimes abscess and renal cell carcinoma, they can have overlapping appearances. This lady came in with hematuria, and this was read, read as an abscess. But when you look at it more carefully, this looks like intrinsically bright on the non-contrast, so it looks much more like a subcapsular hematoma than an abscess. It's a very heterogeneously enhancing mass, and this turns out to be a renal cell carcinoma. So when someone comes in with spontaneous bleeding, really be on high alert that it may be a renal cell carcinoma. A lookalike for, or on the other differential for solid renal neoplasms would be an oncocytoma, 
And the classic feature is a central stellate non-enhancing scar. This is about the best central stellate scar that I can find in a renal mass. So when you have something like this, you can be fairly confident that it's an oncocytoma. But realistically, it can be difficult to differentiate between renal cell carcinoma on both imaging and biopsy. More examples of oncocytomas. On the top left, I can perhaps convince you that this is a nice looking central scar and it's an oncocytoma. But as we move to the top right example, the central scar is a little bit less obvious. And the bottom example, I can't really see the central scar at all. But regardless, when you encounter a solid renal mass, if you're even thinking about oncocytoma, I think it is helpful to include that on your differential because there are other tests like nuclear medicine tests that the clinicians can pursue to try to distinguish between oncocytoma and RCC. Next, we'll talk about angiomyolipoma. It is composed of dysmorphic blood vessels, smooth tissue, and fat. 80% of them are sporadic, and you have the classic AML, fat-poor AML, and also epithelioid AML. And 20% of them are syndromic, with the classic associations of tuberous sclerosis and lymphangioliomatosis. So the algorithm for renal mass that contain fat, next we want to look whether or not there's internal calcifications. If there are calcifications, then we suspect renal cell carcinoma. If not, then we think it's an AML. And then with an AML, then we look, want to look whether it's solitary or there's multiple. And the size, because for small AMLs, they don't really require any more workup. But for AMLs that are four centimeters or more, we need to refer them for management. And, because, and that is because of the risk of bleeding. So this is a classic AML similar to the ones that Dr. Fisherman has shown. So you see a fat and soft tissue attenuation mass. So this is very classic. So no real differential for this mass. And the importance of the four centimeter criteria is because beyond four centimeters, these patients are at high risk of bleeding. And so we wanna avoid this bleeding complication and refer them for embolization. Another example of a small classic angiomyolipoma. And sometimes with these small, smaller AMLs, it's easier to pick up the fat component on the non-con because on the post-contrast, the whole thing is enhancing and it, it can be harder to pick out the small fat components. With the fat-poor AML, there's actually no evidence of fat on unenhanced CT so that they look like hyper-enhanced hyper or isoattenuating masses relative to the regular renal parenchyma. These are very difficult for us to diagnose preoperatively, and, it's, and you just have to accept that sometimes you're going to be wrong. Like this example here, we have this soft tissue attenuation mass that enhances. So most of us would think that it's a renal cell carcinoma, but on path, it turned out to be a fat poor AML. This other example, similarly, you have a soft tissue attenuation mass with no discernible fat, and then it enhances. But so most of us, again, would think that it's a renal cell, but it turns out to be a fat poor AML. There's also an epithelioid subtype of AML, which they don't even see in few or fat or few or no fat cells, even on pathology. So it's almost impossible for us to identify any fat. These tend to be hyperattenuating on non-contrast, heterogeneous enhancement, and they look aggressive due to hemorrhage, and they can be cystic and potentially malignant. And this is an example of an epithelioid AML in which we have a very complex cystic mass with very thick, irregular-looking septations, no discernible fat. So I would say that AML is not really on our radar screen, but just be aware that AML can take these very atypical looking forms. And when we think about a fat containing retroperitoneal mass, the differential would include angiomyolipoma. Renal cell carcinoma, I put an asterisk here because we expect to see 
intracellular lipid with renal cell carcinoma, but not so much the macroscopic fat. The retroperitoneal liposarcoma and also adrenal myelolipoma would be on the list. So the way we distinguish is to look for that claw sign. So here with the angiomyolipoma, we can see that there's this defect in the renal cortex and this fat attenuation mass is mushrooming out of the kidney. So we can tell that it's a renal origin, therefore an angiomyolipoma. This adrenal myelolipoma is quite large, and when you look at it, it can be hard to tell the precise organ of origin, whether it's arising from the kidney or the adrenal gland. So it's also on that differential for fat-containing retroperitoneal mass. And in this case, you have a very heterogeneous fat and soft tissue containing mass that looks like it's more wrapping around, growing around the kidney and you don't really see any defect in the kidney with the claw sign. So this would point you more towards a retroperitoneal liposarcoma. Coincidentally, patient also has a coexisting clear cell renal cell carcinoma that's enhancing quite avidly. And that wraps up the solid renal masses, the, the well-circumscribed growth pattern but we can also get more infiltrative looking renal masses. And on this list, I would consider renal cell carcinoma, renal medullary carcinoma, urothelial carcinoma, and lymphoma. This is an example of clear cell renal cell with IBC invasion. So when we see an aggressive looking mass with vascular invasion, I think renal cell carcinoma is at the top of my list. And similar to the liver talk, the arterial phase is very helpful in showing the internal enhancement of the tumor thrombus that help distinguish that from the bland thrombus. Renal medullary carcinoma is an aggressive renal malignancy in young patients with sickle cell trait. Usually it's centrally located infiltrative mass. And again, it, it is an aggressive lesion that can show renal vascular invasion. And also usually we see retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy or even metastatic disease at time of diagnosis. This is an example of renal medullary carcinoma in which you have this very infiltrative growth pattern centered more centrally in the kidney, already had liver metastases, and also a lot of lymphadenopathy at the time of diagnosis. So a very aggressive looking lesion. Another example, it's a diffusely infiltrative tumor that basically replaced much of the kidney with extensive necrotic lymphadenopathy. So when you see something like this, especially in the right population with this patient with sickle cell trait, this is a, a great thought for that population. Urothelial carcinoma, they arise from the renal pelvic urothelium. And you can also get this infiltrative growth pattern with obliteration of the renal sinus fat, also known as the faceless kidney. But urothelial carcinoma can also have other growth patterns, such as enhancing filling defects within the collecting system, subtle thickening and enhancement of the renal pelvis. And the important thing with urothelial carcinoma is that once you see one, you need to carefully scrutinize the entire collecting system due to the high prevalence of secondary foci of tumor. This is an example of a urothelial carcinoma in which you have a very infiltrative looking mass that's replacing much of the kidney. You have some hydronephrosis and that would be a clue of the collecting system involvement. And this is a classic example of urothelial carcinoma. This is a different look for urothelial carcinoma in which you see this polypoid filling defect within the right renal pelvis. And sometimes these lesions can be a little bit hard to see on the non-con or the arterial and venous phase images, but you can see them very well on the delayed phase images. And that is why we include the delayed phase images in our four-phase renal protocol so that we can catch these urothelial neoplasms. While this is a fairly obvious example, this other case is a much more subtle example. So on the non-con, you can barely appreciate anything on the renal pelvis, 
And the Venus phase, if you're looking very carefully, maybe you can appreciate a little something. But it's a lot more obvious if you have delayed phase images. And then here's the corresponding retrograde urogram so that you can see the filling defect. So again, the delayed phase is key for these urothelial neoplasms. Next, we'll talk about lymphoma. Lymphoma is usually secondary to systemic disease. And we can see bilateral renal involvement in up to 70% of patients. And lymphoma can look like single or multiple masses, diffuse renal infiltration, or perirenal infiltration. And usually, we would also see associated systemic lymphadenopathy, which would be also a clue. In the top row, we can see that diffuse enlargement of the kidneys with preservation of the normal renal form shape, and that is very classic for lymphoma. In the bottom example, it's a little bit more heterogeneous in which we have some cystic degeneration. So lymphoma can have a variety of appearances. And in this other case, it's more primarily a perirenal growth infiltration pattern. This other case, bilateral involvement, extensive perirenal growth pattern, and also soft tissue infiltration throughout the retroperitoneum. Lymphoma and other metastatic disease would be good thoughts for a case like this. And when we see that perirenal infiltrative growth pattern, you can think about certainly lymphoma, retroperitoneal sarcoma, extramedullary hematopoiesis, lymphatic malformation, retroperitoneal fibrosis and hemorrhage, basically anything that can sneak into those nooks and crannies in that perirenal space. This is actually a case of Ertheim Chester. So all those lymphoproliferative diseases would also fall into this category. And not everything that is a renal lesion is a renal cell carcinoma. So obviously, whenever we interpret these, we also need to keep in mind the clinical presentation. If we have the right clinical presentation and a lot of soft tissue stranding around it, that would lean us more towards abscess than a renal neoplasm. Lastly, I'll just touch on active surveillance. In the past, anything that's enhancing in the kidney would end up coming out. But these days, there's more of a push for active surveillance as an alternative for immediate management. And these patients are followed clinically and with serial imaging. And this is recommended in patients in whom the treatment outweighs the, the risk of the treatment outweighs the benefits. And the reason is because a substantial proportion of small solid renal masses are benign, along with the vast majority of cystic renal masses. Small RCCs are typically indolent with low potential for malignancy, and they are usually in older patients, so they are more likely to die from other diseases than from the renal cell carcinoma. And also the RCC treatment have potential complications and they may reduce the renal function and increase the overall mortality. So basically for small, solid renal neoplasms, one centimeter or less, those are usually followed. And then if we see any tumor growth or changes in the morphology, that may trigger a change in the management. Cystic lesions in the Bosnia 2F and 3 categories are usually followed also until we see a morphologic change or reclassification for as a Bosniak 3 or Bosniak 4. In conclusion, renal masses are common incidental findings, and we have ACR guidelines for the further evaluation of incidental renal masses based on size, attenuation, heterogeneity, enhancement, complexity, and growth to help us figure out what to do with these masses. The renal protocol CT or MRI or modalities of choice for the evaluation of indeterminate renal masses, and we can form the differential diagnosis based on the specific imaging features and patient characteristics. And thank you very much.